What do I think of the presences? Well, I think there have been some minor changes as far as living condition and the food. Living in the prison system as it stands is very poor. We're not living, we just survive. Uh, as a man, I've been a draper going on seven years now and I've seen a lot of improvements. It's a lot cleaner than what it used to be. The food is better, it could be better. Since I've been here, I've seen a lot of improvements. I've been here two and a half years. And uh, anytime you get a group of guys like this living together, you're never going to agree on anything. So there are certain complaints about certain things. But uh, the, the living conditions are better and the food is improving. Could be a little better, but you know they're still working on that. I think uh, Judge Johnson's done a good job. Considerable uh, progress has been made in uh, the past year, uh, particularly in the light of uh, Judge Johnson's court order. For instance, uh, the count has been radically reduced so that uh, the number of inmates within the prisons is within the stipulated uh, number. Uh, we won't be satisfied until uh, we are have. Uh, fully implemented the court order. They put too much uh, emphasis and uh, uh, on uh, what happens to the man who shoots and kills you. And they ought to put emphasis on trying to prevent that from happening by giving sure and swift punishment. And that brings up the question of rehabilitation. This is something that we have done a very poor job of. In fact, we've probably manufactured some rather good criminals out of our system who went in maybe for minor offenses. <laughs> More attention has been focused on Alabama's prisons in the past 18 months than ever before in the state's history. Prison reform and prison improvements have long been ignored by politicians because it isn't a popular vote-getting issue. A mandate by the federal court may be forcing a change in that approach. For the next few minutes, we'll be taking a look at Alabama's prisons, and we'll have that look after this message. It's difficult to say for certain when conditions in Alabama's prisons began the downward trend that eventually led to a federal court order of January 13, 1976, calling for sweeping changes in the prisons. Attention was focused on the situation a few years ago before the court order, when inmates at Atmore's two facilities in South Alabama began to protest their unrest associated with the problems of overcrowding. January 1974, a guard and an inmate were killed in an uprising at Fountains Correctional Center. In February, a suit was filed in Montgomery Federal Court by one inmate seeking protection from violent inmates. May of 1974, the Board of Corrections became aware that overcrowding problems at the Mount Meigs Medical and Diagnostic Center existed. This was followed by complaints of a lack of rehabilitation provisions and the first reports of inmates sleeping on prison floors. August 28, 1975, the state admitted in federal court that state prisoners are subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. 
The next day, U.S. District Court Judge Frank Johnson, Jr., ruled that the state prisons could not accept any more prisoners until the inmate population was below the system's design capacity. That same week, a riot at the Mount Meigs prison left some 30 inmates injured. Overcrowded facilities caused the disturbance. Three months later, and after Judge C. Locke, Jr. takes over as prisons commissioner, Judge Johnson handed down his landmark decision labeling Alabama's prisons unfit for human habitation. He cataloged in detail the conditions in four of the state's prisons, Draper and Elmore County, Kilby at Mount Meigs, Fountain and Holman prisons at Atmore in Escambia County. Johnson's order required the prisons to meet a long list of minimum constitutional standards for inmates, food to be improved, sleeping spaces enlarged, better hygiene and health care, and better treatment by personnel. Johnson threatened to order the prisons closed if standards affecting virtually every area of prisons operations were not met. A 39-member Human Rights Committee was established under the court order. It's headed by Montgomery attorney Roland Nockman, who immediately hired Dr. George Beto of Texas as a consultant and to get expert views on prison operations. Considerable uh, progress has been made in uh, the past year, particularly in the light of uh, Judge Johnson's court order. For instance, uh, the count has been radically reduced so that uh, the number of inmates within the prisons is within the stipulated uh, number. Uh, the prisons are considerably cleaner than they were a year ago. Uh, as a result of uh, the, the prudent use of the good time law, the amount of violence in the institutions, in my opinion, has been diminished. Uh, the legislature has uh, cooperated uh, to the extent that it passed a uh, prison industry bill or state use law. Implementation has begun on that. Uh, the legislature also created a non-geographical school district within the department. And cooperative uh, work has been done between the, the Department of Corrections and the Department of Education in implementing that legislation. Uh, a serious problem, not only in Alabama, but in any state prison, is uh, the medical attention with inma which inmates receive security of prisoners, for example, is, is still a matter of considerable concern. And, uh, long knives made out of uh, uh, T-squares are, are found in a routine shakedown that, that occurs and this kind of thing. Uh, uh, there's really no meaningful work program yet in the prisons, and this was an essential part of Judge Johnson's order, not only to provide work for uh, to combat idleness, but to produce income for the prison system and, for, and to reduce the cost of operating other state agencies by making goods and services cheaper. The legislature passed a compulsory use law, but as of this moment, I don't know that the Board of Corrections uh, has even made a survey of state agencies to see what they need. has seen the greatest improvements in conditions today on a comparative basis, possibly because there was more to correct. Conditions like this no longer exist. Fountain in operation since 1949 is designed to accommodate 632 inmates. At the height of its overcrowding, the figure exceeded 1,100 prisoners. Kilby Correctional Center was called the Mount Meigs Medical and Diagnostic Center at the height of prison's overcrowding. Prior to the court order of August 1975, barring admissions, more than 800 prisoners were crammed into the 500 capacity facility. Inmates were forced to sleep on the floor, in hallways, and even in shower stalls. Renovation is taking place. 
Cell blocks A and B are getting a complete going over. C and D are in the process of being renovated. And instances of violence, once a nightmare, are way down at Kilby. Draper Prison at Spigner in Elmore County was the most severely criticized facility under the federal court order. Some experts called Draper one of the most dangerous prison facilities ever seen. Solitary confinement was barbaric. Prisoners packed weapons for self-survival. Food, health care, and housing were appalling. Food service has improved, but it's still a headache. Many eat because they're hungry. Pay for personnel has handicapped improvements. Most inmates now have some sort of job assignment. Efforts are being made to educate inmates. And there are more adequate sleeping quarters. Draper was built in 1939, and until recently, there has been very little upkeep in its 37 years. Population is down, and so is violence. Regular inspections of facilities help to keep the institution in livable condition. Population, once at the 1,000 level, is down to near 600. Judson Locke has been the prison's chief administrator for almost a year and a half. The 45-year-old career state employee has been bombarded by critics. He denies mismanagement. His critics say he is too slow to act. His associates say he responds when there is need and acts decisively when necessary. Will the construction of more prisons solve the prison problems? This will be part of the solution. We have, uh, any organization has uh, management problems, and I've alluded to this in trying to realign uh, functions uh, to fit the person, to uh, bring in uh, uh, new personnel that we know are needed. Uh, it's a problem. The housing of state prisoners is a problem for the state of Alabama to address from the governor's office, including uh, both houses of the legislature. Uh, this is a problem that uh, is going to be uh, expanded because of the influx of uh, more prisoners. We don't have the uh, uh, housing for them. It's that simple. There have to, there have to be additional prisons built or alternatives developed. Uh, this is the issue. We're going to have to have uh, more money for more facilities, and it's going to be costly. I can see no Governor George Wallace, in his State of the State address, devoted a good deal of time to law and order, but did not address himself fully regarding prisons. The Department of Corrections submitted a budget request of $40 million with most of the money marked for personnel. The governor turned a deaf ear to that budget request and instead allowed the prisons to spend some $19 million in the next fiscal year. Later, Wallace said the state could not afford the budget requested by the department. A $40 million budget for prisons. Uh, the state cannot afford a $40 million budget for prisons out of the general fund of Alabama. Uh, they could not get funds from any other source, that is, from educational funds or otherwise, so they have to come from the general fund. And the general fund operates Medicaid and old age and uh, pensions and welfare and the state police and the courts and a multiplicity of other operations of state government. Uh, that's more money than the state is going to be able to provide unless you had new taxes. Of course, I'm for no new taxes. Uh, so they cannot get that uh, much money. They could have used, of course, more money because they have a difficult problem from getting from one month to the other. Prison officials have repeatedly pointed out that under the federal court order, the state can accommodate only 3,900 inmates. And the predictions are that within three years, the state's total inmate population will be 9,000. Can the state afford to build new prisons and does it have the support of the governor? Yes, the, uh, the Department of Corrections is going to build a new minimum security prison beginning in February, beginning this month. Uh, they're also looking for another site for another prison, possibly North Alabama, although I hope and uh, have asked them, of course, not to build uh, where the people of the particular county or area do not want them. We have, of course, land in Alabama that uh, belongs to the prison system upon which a new uh, prison could be built. We also have around uh, six million, four million dollars left from the bond issue voted by the people and four million dollars uh, uh, of revenue sharing funds that the governor provided them, which means they have 
I believe in the neighborhood of six to seven, eight millions of dollars that will be used for capital outlay to try to relieve uh, the jails, the county jails in Alabama and city jails of prisoners that rightfully belong in the state penitentiary. Prisons Commissioner Locke states that $2 million have been set aside for a new 350-man facility near Draper Correctional Center. He said the money hasn't been spent because there has been a delay in obtaining clarification from the federal court on what kind of facilities could be built. The problem of locating sites, particularly in North Alabama, is another reason. You talking about down here often? Well, I can see I have hope and faith in uh, focusing the proper attention, uh, getting the uh, attention of the proper people uh, in positions in government to realize the magnitude of the problem. Uh, the Board of Corrections is at one end of the whole spectrum of criminal justice. And uh, we are the dumping ground, so to speak. And uh, we get the man and are told to correct him. It's virtually impossible, but uh, with a little more cooperation, we're going to need some funding. Uh, we're going to have to have money to build these institutions. They're going to either have to be built in the community it will have to be bigger and more jails or bigger and more prisons. And uh, I would hope that uh, alternatives would be developed along the way to uh, uh, prevent having to house every person, you know. I, I'm of the opinion that we don't have to incarcerate in a maximum security uh, facility every person. And uh, there should be uh, alternatives on the community level. Lieutenant Governor Jerry Beasley, skeptical of an independent group's findings that the Alabama prison system is being run as well as can be expected without adequate and stable funding, has blamed mismanagement for prison problems and recommends changes in the prison personnel. What can the legislature do to help the prisons? Well, the legislature and state government generally can do a number of things. Uh, a lot of people have the impression that the only way to solve the problems in the prison system is just to funnel more money into the system. And I felt all along that this would be a, a tragic mistake to uh, place more money into a system where you have uh, serious management problems and have other problems that have caused uh, probably more difficulty within the prison system than has a lack of funding. In fact, the legislature has appropriated uh, funds to the prison system in rather substantial amounts over the past uh, several years. In fact, uh, I expect the legislature appropriated a higher percentage of what the prison system asked for than perhaps any other uh, division or agency or department of state government prior to probably last year, perhaps the year before when the demands all of a sudden became extremely high after the federal court order was put into effect. Associate Prisons Commissioner Larry Bennett takes issue with Beasley. If funding by the state is mismanagement, he says, then the prisons might be guilty. We spend $7.30 a day for each public offender in the state prison system. The next state in the United States in funds spent on a per day basis, the state of Georgia. They spend $10.95 a day. The <clears throat> national average is slightly over $19 a day for the money spent per prisoner by, you know, the state, the State Department of Corrections, whatever name it might be called by. Of the, counting the District of Columbia, out of uh, 51 entities, the 50 states plus the District of Columbia, we're number 51, and the amount of money spent per prisoner per, per day in the, state of, in the state of Alabama and in the United States. Now, the people, you know, up on Capitol Hill, they talk about uh, neglect and mismanagement, and I submit that the neglect comes from years of neglect. <coughs> it's not something that has happened, you know, last year or the year before. County jails have been described as the horror of our age. And we look at that aspect of the prison system in a moment.
A jungle atmosphere prevails in county jails, primarily because they are not designed to house long-term prisoners. We had to start keeping the prisoners that were sentenced to the penitentiary. We were only keeping short-termers, and I believe uh, the maximum sentence we would have in the county jail would be 18 months, and that was more or less for trusty purposes, you know, working around the jail and what have you. But when they had to start keeping the state prisoners, life-termers, 30- and 40-year prisoners, it created a real situation because you don't, the jail in the first place is not intended for that. And uh, you, you have no facilities here to take care of long-termers like that. In the first place, you have no exercise facilities, no outside activities whatsoever, and all you can do is just keep them pinned up. And naturally, when you have a, a crowded situation like that, having to throw them all in together and keep them pinned up together, it creates more problems than you could believe. The Alabama Supreme Court has under advisement conflicting circuit court orders regarding the transfer of state inmates between county jails to ease overcrowding. Prison officials warn that massive and total confusion would result if circuit court judges continue to issue conflicting orders regarding the transfer of these inmates. The court has been asked to allow the prison's commissioner the right to use his discretion in transferring the prisoners. Houston County officials recently conceded the constitutional rights of prisoners were violated in the county jail and agreed to a court decree requiring major reforms in jail procedures. U.S. District Court Judge Frank Johnson, Jr. ordered the population of the jail not to exceed its designed capacity of inmates, that inmates be given sufficient food and medical care, and that visiting hours be liberalized. The county conceded that the jail was not sanitary, that the food was not adequate, that there were not enough fire safety precautions, and that inmates did not receive enough medical care. The county has been ordered to build a new jail within two years, and the current jail be renovated by the end of the year, so that each cell will have at least 60 square feet of space per inmate. The cells must have adequate ventilation, a sink with hot and cold running water, and adequate light. Some state legislators have labeled Governor George Wallace's crime package as lock em up and throw away the keys legislation. Wallace's crime package calls for longer prison sentences and bars parole for certain prisoners. Some in the legislature say the package requires the state to spend a whole lot of money to build new prisons to hold convicts for the longer sentences. This they say despite the fact that prison facilities cannot hold all the convicts, a fact that is backed up by the overcrowding of county jails. Some suggestions by the prison's commissioner in just a moment. A program under which a criminal would be ordered to work to repay his victim has support in some states. Some have already set up crime victims' compensation programs under which crime victims are reimbursed by the state for their losses. Not so in Alabama, but prison officials have some restitution ideas. There are restitution centers, for example, that have been successful in some 10 or 11 states. Now, a neighboring state here of Georgia is one of the vanguards in restitution. This is a uh, symbolic and a monetary restitution to the victim. And it is a uh, another means of the 
person paying his debt to the victim and to society without having to be incarcerated in a conventional type prison. And it's a step between uh, probation and the conventional prison. This and uh, more probation, better methods of supervision, other alternatives, that some of which have never been developed, that should be uh, pursued on the local level. The problems and the possible solution to those problems in Alabama's prisons are probably as numerous as the number of inmates incarcerated. Prison officials have repeatedly said they cannot alleviate conditions as they should because of inadequate funding by the state legislature. Judge Johnson, in his order, says a state is not at liberty to afford its citizens those constitutional rights which fit comfortably within its budget. Johnson further stated, it's established beyond a doubt that inadequate funding is no answer to the existence of unconstitutional conditions in state penal institutions. Prisoners are not to be coddled and prisons are not to be operated as hotels or country clubs. However, the court says this does not mean that responsible state officials, including the state legislature, can be allowed to operate prison facilities that are barbaric and inhumane.